You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. US-led forces have stepped up airstrikes against Islamic State or ISIS fighters threatening the Syrian town of Kobani. That's near the Turkish border. This comes after Turkish officials denied reaching an agreement with the US to use its Incirlik air base in the southern city of Adana, 100 miles from the Syrian border. This runs counter to comments by the US National Security Advisor Susan Rice, who said Turkey had agreed with Washington to let coalition forces use its military bases. The Turkish government has faced pressure to take up a more decisive role in fighting ISIS. Protests erupted around Turkey over a perceived lack of action from Ankara, which wants to see any help it offers tied to a coalition pledge to oust the Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad. So, is the campaign of ISIS shifting regional alliances? What will the US-led coalition strategy to tackle ISIS be? And what are Turkey's role? Well, to discuss this, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Tun Shaibak. He's program leader of international politics at Middlesex University and an advisor at the Centre for Turkey Studies. Also here is Bill Park. He's a senior lecturer in defence studies at King's College London and his latest book is called Modern Turkey, People, State and Foreign Policy in a Globalised World. On the line we have Galip Dale in Ankara. Uh, he is a political researcher at the think tank the Seta Foundation in Ankara. Currently he's a visiting fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin and also on the line from Russia, Alexander Sotnichenko. He's associate professor at the St. Petersburg State University uh, at the School of International Relations there. A warm welcome to you all, gentlemen. First of all, I'll start with you, Tunch. Uh, interesting what Turkey has said in that it's made no decision on offering help on the air base yet. Um, why do you think it's being so ambivalent? I think we are fishing in uh, muddy waters here because there's no clarity whether Turkey agrees to the use of military bases or not. Actually, this has been the typical policy of, of, of the Turkish, if you like, uh, foreign policy practitioners in many respects and then Turkey uh, seems to have chosen a kind of passive aggressive kind of posture in in relation to the Syrian crisis. Does that chime with what you think Galip? There are mixed messages coming from uh, President Erdogan over just what kind of support it would lend the United States if any. Well I feel like Turkey first I mean, uh, Turkey did not deny that it had let the U.S. to use its air force. Rather, it said, like, you know, more or less it said, like, there is nothing new in our conversation with the United States. But that, 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 did, that did not exclude the possibility of the U.S. using the military bases in Turkey. And I think in the end, the military base in Turkey is going to be used. So therefore, like, it will be part of the support that Turkey is going to offer to the U.S. or the coalition uh, in their bombing campaign. And right now, the uh, primary concern for Turkey is that, like, you know, this uh, use of military, this, this use, of, use of military base is basically depicted in the context of uh, bombing the ISIS, but not the rest of the, not the Assad regime. I think somehow Turkey wants to get, like, you know, some words, some declaration also that uh, somehow talks about some measures in action against the Assad regime. But in the end, uh, I think like, you know, Turkey is going to uh, let the coalition to use its air base. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about that, Bill? Is this just a play for time on uh, Mr Erdogan's part? It's possible he'll eventually commit. I mean, I'm not sure there is that much ambiguity about the Turkish position. Um, essentially, what they're looking for is a commitment to the overthrow of Assad, first and foremost, um, with a number of steps between now and that, things like establishing a humanitarian corridor inside Syrian territory in a no-fly zone. So I think this is hard bargaining on the part of Turkey. They've been pushing this kind of agenda for some time now. And I think their position is quite clear. What is interesting about it is that it contrasts so much with, the, uh, with uh, Washington's Arab allies in the region who very quickly committed to join the bombing campaign uh, against ISIS. So Turkey's position is distinctive but I'm not sure it's that ambiguous or, or even that new at the moment. So the, having Bashar al-Assad as part of the deal, um, his ouster being part of any kind of support, um, strange, I suppose, that the US and, and certainly Britain don't want to really make that too overt, um, that we're going to remove Assad parliament that, that faced a vote on this. It was, uh, it was, it was defeated last year. Um, not particularly popular. No, I mean, Britain and uh, the other NATO and Western allies, in fact, they're not bombing in Syria at all. And the reason for that is because of the legal uh, uncertainty about doing so. Uh, 
In the case of Iraq, technically the Baghdad government has invited allies to, to conduct a bombing campaign against Islamic State. So legally that stands up. Uh, Syria is a much more complicated case. I think also with Syria, uh, the West has been looking around for some moderate uh, rebels uh, to support for some time and frankly concluded that the rebels were either not very moderate or too divided to support. Uh, so I think it's not so much that the West isn't committed to the overthrow of Assad, is that it really doesn't know and hasn't known for, for a couple of years now how to go about it. Mr Erdogan, he's issued a warning that Kobani could fall into ISIS hands and that airstrikes would not be enough to repel IS. Um, he clearly sees troops on the ground as a solution, doesn't he, Tunch? Yeah, he wants no fly zone. Also, you know, maybe some kind of... Uh, I think he's very reluctant to commit himself to the ground operation at this very moment. And, uh, you know, I think the strategy Turkey adopted here uh, is a pretty, not the strategy, actually, it's a tactic, you know, a shallow one, in the sense that, you know, Assad's enemies are my friends, attitude. You know, this is, Davut all wrote this book about strategic theft, but this is a kind of very dangerous strategy. That's why, uh, in a way, Turkey has become the victim of its own policies in, 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 relation, to the, in relation to the situation in, in Syria. Uh, Gary, because I think certainly um, criticism of Mr Erdogan here in the West has been one of um, Turkish tanks lying idle while Kobani goes up in flames and all that kind of stuff. It's a bit more complicated than that, but there have been considerable protests throughout Turkey uh, about people who feel aggrieved that the Kurds on the other side of the border are being left. Well, I mean, for Turkey, it's a hard position right now to be in. Like, you know, in a, in a sense, it's a, it, you know, it finds, uh, it finds itself in an extremely difficult situation. On the one hand, you know, the ISIS not only posing a menacing threat to the Kurds in Kobani, but also, like, you know, once the Kobani falls, ISIS will pose a menacing threat to Turkey as well. But on the other hand, like, you know, the Turkey regards, you know, PYD as a Syrian wing of the PKK, and rightly so. And in the end, despite the peace talks it's conducting with PKK, it's still PKK is being regarded as a terrorist organization by Turkey. So therefore, like, you know, uh, there is a consider. There will be a considerable, uh, you know, uh, th th there is a considerable. There will be a considerable opposition against Turkey, you know, using any military, uh, any uh, offering any military help to PYD or the Kobani. But right now, I said this is not what I think. Like you know, the PYD is asking for. Uh, what PYD is asking for is basically Turkey opening the corridor for the arm or the other supply to be transferred through Turkey, through Turkey uh, to Kobani. And I think, <clears throat> and I think the, government, uh, the government regards such an action, like to some extent emboldening PKK and, you know, strengthening the PKKs, like uh, the, strength, the strengthening of the PYD will, is regarded by government as a strengthening of the PKK. And it thinks that, you know, it will have a negative impact on the course of the pro peace process. But doing nothing is also having a negative impact on the course of peace process. So therefore, like, you know, I think it's a quite, quite uh, for the government, it's a quite hard situation to be in. And I don't see, like, you know, what strategy right now the government has in place to deal with it. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. We're discussing Turkey and its role in the fight against ISIS. With me in the studio, Tun Shaibak, Programme Leader of International Politics at Middlesex University, Bill Park, Senior Lecturer in Defence Studies at King's College London. On the line, we have Galip Dalai, political researcher at the CETA Foundation, and in Russia, Alexander Sotnanchenka, Associate Professor at the St. Petersburg State University. Because I suppose, I suppose Bill... Um, Perhaps he hasn't quite got the credit, or Turkey hasn't quite got the credit for the sheer number of refugees that are flooding into the east of the country, and certainly um, he is seeing that the PKK is as much of a threat as, as ISIS, and not forgetting that PKK is a terrorist organisation recognised by the United States. Why would you want to help them? Yeah, um, I think Turkey has had some credit. What it hasn't had is enough assistance in the support of the million or so refugees that it's uh, hosting at the moment. Um, but on the issue of the PKK, uh, I think you, when you look at Turkish behaviour, you have to say there's a sort of pecking order, and I accept absolutely what Dalip said about this is a very difficult situation for Ankara. 
But I think, first of all, their priority is overthrow Assad, and, and yes, they've been supporting anybody who would overthrow Assad. But I think second comes the PKK and the PYD in Syria. And I think Islamic State has has come third in Turkey's priorities. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, if Kobani falls, it's not only a blow to the Kurds and a blow to the peace process inside Turkey. It also means another bit of the border with Syria is controlled by Islamic State. Uh, and yet Turkey, uh, one can't say it's relaxed in the face of that, but the fact is it's doing nothing in the face of that uh, possibility. So it does look a little bit like Turkey has priorities in order and the bottom priority is Islamic State. And, of course, it's very much the other way around for the US and its allies. And if Kobani did fall, and, and Mr Erdogan has raised that possibility, um, in terms of what Abdullah Ocalan, the jailed PKK leader, has said, what his threat that there would be a resumption of host hostilities uh, if Kobani falls, I mean, is that to be taken seriously, do you think? Tosh? I think that should be taken very, very seriously. By adopting sectarian policies in relation to Syria, actually, Erdogan, maybe the unintended consequences linked the regional developments to the Kurdish peace process. This wasn't his intention in Turkey. So this has serious ramifications. When you look at the recent, if you like, uprisings or revolts, if you like, in the, in the East, some of them were carried out. Some, uh, if you like, as Turkish government sees it, terrorist activities by Turkish splinter groups. As the crisis deepens, actually we will be witnessing more and more splinter groups, not the PKK, but other groups also will be resorting to this kind of violence. So as the borders are now much more porous, and you can see that the spillage, spillover of this, of this Kurdish issue inside out or outside in type of linkages are going to be actually much more kind of um, prominent. Alexander, I'll turn to you in Russia there. Interesting comments made by John Kerry and uh, Sergei Lavrov. They've pledged to cooperate in tackling the threat of ISIS. But how do they view Turkey, Turkey's role in combating ISIS? Because the relationship between Moscow and Ankara um, has, has changed over the last few months, hasn't it? Uh, yes, they had changed, but we can't say that they changed dramatically. Uh, we have the same high level of economic relations, and uh, uh, I can't say that uh, even the, our positions over uh, al-Assad regime really uh, dramatically changed our political relations. Uh, nowadays, situation uh, with uh, ISIS, uh, also I think it is uh, um, really the position uh, which can uh, not change our cooperation, uh, because uh, Russia also uh, 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 Russia and Turkey, we don't like the situation in Iraq. Uh, we send uh, our weapon to Iraq, uh, Iraqi regime, and uh, Ankara also try to support the international coalition. And at the same time, uh, no Russia, neither Ankara, uh, we uh, don't uh, uh, take uh, part in active uh, phase of the operation. Uh, we don't bomb the positions of the rebels, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, this, op uh, this situation can even uh, unite the positions of our countries. But having said that, though, I mean, Moscow was unhappy with clearly with NATO and NATO expansion and NATO's role in events in Ukraine, and unhappy with Ankara's role in that. I mean, is there a possibility that um, uh, it may actually, there may be some kind of blowback or some kind of backlash from Russia if it's unhappy with how Turkey deals with ISIS? Yes, uh, no, but Ukraine is uh, quite far from the region. Uh, but really, Moscow is unhappy with the Ankara position over al-Assad regime. Uh, but at the same time, we can say that really our um, uh, the, the, uh, we, that we can say that our disagreements over serious situation really can destroy our uh, relations. Uh, the main problem with Russia, I think, uh, is that Russia has not uh, any its own program uh, to uh, resolve the conflict in the Middle East. And that's why we can uh, support the position of the international coalition or uh, at the same time, or we can oppose this uh, position, but we don't uh, show our own program.
But having said that, Alexander, Russia is vehemently against Bashar al-Assad being overthrown and sees any kind of solution to that crisis involving Bashar al-Assad, and that's something that Mr Erdogan uh, would not countenance. That's got to be a problem, right? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, firstly, it is a great problem for Mr Erdogan because I think that Turkey now is, the, is in the most uh, difficult position at the last uh, 15 years. It has so many enemies. Uh, Turkey wants to be against the Assad regime, against Kurds in uh, northern Syria, at the same time against uh, ISIS. Uh, because it became the part of the coalition, and uh, so many enemies, it, it is against the conception of the Kugvu with zero problems with uh, neighbors. And uh, so now I don't know how Erdogan will fix uh, all these uh, problems. Does Turkey doubt the ability of NATO to protect it? I think there is a, a kind of paradox here that Turkey wants to uh, play a kind of regional hegemonic role, wants to influence the developments in the region. On the other hand, Turkey is a NATO member, and these interests do not always converge, even though Turkey, Turkish and American interests, or the NATO interests, let's not say American, uh, converge. There are some differences in terms of, you know, um, uh, Turkey's involvement or the extent of Turkey's involvement in the Middle East. Uh, sometimes it might seem to the NATO, the other NATO members, that Turkey is punching a bit above its weight. You know, so uh, the main threat, actually, when you look at it, comes from when, when Bill already mentioned that the ISIS is not the main priority. Actually, comes from the Rojava model. You know, that kind of self-governing governing Kurd. Kurdish autonomous region is the main threat. As you know, Turkey has had very good relations with the Kurdish regional government. And then, if if you ever been, if you have been to the Kurdish uh, regional government, uh, regional government, uh, the area, uh, you know, you can use actually Turkish money, you know, instead of Iraqi dinars. It's a kind of yesterday we was talking with uh, with another expert. It's like has become a Turkish Commonwealth Ottoman model. So Turkey wants to pro- pro- promote that Kurdish regional government model, top down approach. So they feel a bit threatened by this self governing self governing Kurdish autonomous mo- movements popping up. All, all over the place and spilling into Turkey. So that's the main threat. That's why Turkey is just sitting on its hands and um, uh, letting uh, ISIS sort out this problem for them. But it is, it is, it is it's going to, the consequences will be serious. Gali, what do you make of that? I mean, the idea that really uh, there is a commitment on Turkey's part um, soon enough to come to some kind of agreement with Turkey's Kurds. And this is probably, maybe this is coming a bit too quickly for them. They want to wait, to, Mr Erdogan wants to wait maybe till next year um, to uh, kickstart some kind of process which would le- lead to reconciliation and, and a deal with Turkish Kurds. Um, this is too quick for them. Well, I'm like, in that, like this peace process, as the name suggests, is a process. It's not like not an event. So therefore, like, you know, when we talk about like steps, like, you know, we can we can discuss like about the nature of like each and every step that needs to be taken like you know during the process but you know uh, the speed the discussion of uh, of uh, the discussion over the speed is you know <clears throat> i don't know whether it uh, to some extent it's, it's a healthy one like you know turkey has already taken some steps like you know i mean turkey has taken this issue to within the parliamentary framework like they passed the legislation and yesterday there was in the news that you know there is like a six steps uh, resolution, uh, the six steps roadmap, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So therefore, Turkey is taking some steps, and Turkey is aware of the fact that the Kurdish process, both internally and internationally, Turkey is the most significant narrative that is telling to the world, the positive narrative, because like you know things on the Turkish border in Syria and Iraq is deteriorating and is you know quite bad, and so right now like you know the only significant positive that is being offered from Turkey to outside the world is the peace process. Therefore, the government is acutely aware of this fact. So, I mean, uh, the Rojava and especially the Syrian dimension, the Kurdish dimension of the Syrian crisis, uh, I think, like, you know, convincing some segment within the Kurdish movement that Kurds are in a you know, stronger position to negotiate a better deal, and especially, like, you know, that, that concerns. Uh, things about the political status of the peace process, 
where Ankara is not ready, I think, like, you know, to deal with this aspect. Right now, I think it's not about the, pro, it's not about the speed or the, uh, it's not about the speed, but about the nature of the deal that is going to be on the table between Ankara and the PKK that creates the problem. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. We're discussing Turkey's role in tackling ISIS with Tunç Aybak, Bill Park, Galip Dale and Alexander Sotnachenko. Bill, I suppose um, most Western analysts would probably accept that um, the fight against ISIS is playing into, say, the autonomous Kurdish area of, of Iraq, for instance, and the bolstering of their military and so on, and um, perhaps tacitly accepting that there will be an independent Kurdistan in that part of Iraq potentially in the future. Um, this is happening quite quickly for Mr Erdogan to process and come up with some kind of uh, solution, isn't it? I feel it's too early to say that this crisis will more likely lead to independent independence for the Kurds, either in Iraq or anywhere else. Uh, Iraq and Kurdistan is under terrible pressure. They're getting no money from Baghdad. Actually, Baghdad is restricting the supply of heavy arms to the Kurdistan regional government, Peshmerga. Um, the, even the Americans are quite reluctant to arm the Peshmerga. It's, after all, a non-state actor. Its two leading parties are regarded also regarded as terrorist organisations in the United States, which is quite paradoxical. Um, so I think that the Kurdistan regional government has a lot of problems. And I think with respect to the Rojava and the self-governing Kurdish areas in Syria, precisely what Turkey does not want is for that to be a model for Turkey. So Turkey tends to compartmentalise the Kurdish issue in Iraq from the Kurdish issue in Syria and Turkey. Why? Primarily that's because President Bazani of the Kurdistan regional government can be regarded as a friend to Turkey whereas the leadership of Syria's and Turkey's Kurds are not regarded particularly as friends for Ankara. So they want a kind of Bazani model, if you like. If Bazani could control the whole thing, Turkey would probably be prepared to move a bit faster. Um, on the peace process inside Turkey, uh, I'm already quite sceptical. It takes two to tango. Um, the Kurds of Turkey have been getting more frustrated, especially the hardliners in the mountains. Uh, just a couple of days back, Turkey resorted to bombing. Uh, PKK camps actually inside Turkish territory whilst watching the Kurds of Kobani be put under enormous pressure. Today, Ocalan laid down a deadline for Ankara to come up with some more concrete set of proposals for the peace movement. What happens if, and it's certainly true that Ankara will not come up with those proposals, we'll find out by the end of, of the day. I'm very pessimistic about the peace process inside Turkey because I think the Kurdish leadership in Turkey has become really very frustrated with it. Will they, I mean, will they listen to Ocalan's Call for a deadline, do you think, Tunch? I mean, uh, and, and are you pessimistic about that hope? Uh, I'm equally pessimistic, uh, given the contextual changes happening in the Middle East, and it, it has made it even more difficult now for this peace process to go ahead, you know. And Ojalan definitely is as, as an interlocutor in terms of the Kurdish peace process, because there, we don't have any other, and, and that there are lots of Kurdish groups respecting and expecting him to, I mean, even the Turkish government is reluctant to get involved with him directly uh, as the representatives of the Kurdish communities in Turkey. What did you make of um, Mr Erdogan's rather bullish speech referencing Lawrence of Arabia and so on um, the other day? And, and I mean, given, NATO, given Turkey's role as a significant NATO Member, um, do you think it was quite anti-Western? What, what, what was your what was your kind of um, interpretation of, of what he had to say and who he had to say it to? Uh, I don't know which, in in which context he used Lawrence and Arabia uh, analogy, but um, I mean Erdogan is a great tactician, so he, he he's uh, actually. In different contexts, he, uh, for instance, he goes to Shanghai Cooperation Organization and he says, I want to join the Shanghai Go Cooperation Organization. I think that's kind of a uh, propose for the consumption, consumption of the Arabs, you know, the Lawrence Arabia, the Western in interests, and playing into the hands of so-called anti-imperialist rhetoric, you know, bringing that up. Uh, as you know, Lawrence of Arabia uh, symbolizes, in a way, the betrayal of Arabs also, you know. So that's a kind of... Uh, and an uprising bill against the Ottoman Empire. I mean, did, did you? Did, what did you take from what he had to say? He's speaking to those that support him. I mean, he's almost a cult figure, at least amongst his own supporters in Turkey. And he knows exactly what 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 appeals to that 
part of the electorate or Turkish society. The problem that Erdogan has, a longer term, you asked a question about NATO earlier on, is that NATO is very polite in a sense. It doesn't expel its members and it doesn't tick them off. But the rhetoric coming from Erdogan in particular, but from Ankara in general, is about as anti-Western as anybody's in the Middle East at the moment, uh, even including Tehran, which is now softer. Uh, I've been, I was in Washington quite recently, and it's very, very evident that Americans are extremely frustrated and even angry with, with Ankara. So I feel, yes, Erdogan is a great tactician domestically, but he's doing massive damage to Turkey's alliances externally. How that plays out, how that manifests itself, is a question that I think we'll see in the coming months and even years. But there's no doubt that by making that sort of comment, and some of the other rhetoric that he comes out with, he's alienating a lot of Western opinion in Washington and indeed in the EU. Alexander, do you think he's alienating opinion with comments like that? Uh, I think that the history of Ottoman Empire is very actual for Turkish political life because now Ottomanism is really a conception and uh, uh, this conception is very popular in Turkey now because really uh, not far from uh, here, Professor Norman Stone some days ago he wrote that uh, Turkey uh, has got its borders uh, in uh, 1923 where the population was only about 10 million people and uh, there were no so great problems in the region. Now Turkey, it is a part of the great uh, 20 and uh, it uh, wants to be a part of the uh, the 10th uh, most powerful economics in uh, the world uh, the next uh, 15 years and so it has great plans and really it is uh, Turkey, it is a very small country for the great uh, people like uh, for these great people and they really want to uh, uh, maybe reform re uh, re revise the situation in the Middle East uh, Turkey feel uh, itself uh, as a great power, great regional power and uh, really they try to rethink the situation of the beginning of 20th century, the invasion of the West and nowadays the invasion of the United States and uh, to Iraq, to Afghanistan, and uh, uh, gives uh, Turkey a good example how uh, to do what to do in the region and what not to do. Uh, uh, really, Turkey now become, becomes uh, the uh, power, and uh, we, uh, Russia, we can't uh, reject the relations with them in the region. I think that the only one way to uh, resolve the problems in the region is the regional uh, communication, the regional uh, cooperation between Russia, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, and we uh, have to know that uh, all the problems in the region sometimes come uh, from the non-regional powers like the United States. And uh, I see uh, really uh, great uh, prospects of the relations between Turkey and Russia in the region. Well, I think, like, you know, uh, when we talk about, like, Turkey's relation with the West, I think, like, one of the, the fundamental mistakes that I think, like, most analysts do, they focus too much on the discourse rather than the deeds. And uh, one of the good things that the decision makers thought, they focus too, they focus well enough on this rather than the discourse. I mean, the talk of Lawrence uh, uh, that Erdogan has a couple of days ago, it was, primarily, it was primarily aimed at domestic consumptions. And the person that he referred to it as a Lawrence was this clerical uh, called Fethullah Gülen. So therefore, like, you know, when you, you know, when the Western decision makers, you know, uh, I think focus on this issue, they kind of take into consideration the context and the meaning of this, uh, you know, this uh, pronunciation coming from Ankara. So from that perspective, I don't see, because the NATO has been, you know, almost 50 years, the main foundation of Turkey's security culture, and it is it likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. And I think, like, you know, it's being shared both in Ankara and also like, you know, right now when I talk with people in Brussels and Berlin and this is more, more like, more or less what their opinion is. Definitely these discourses are also uh, alienating the public opinion, but I don't think that it's shifting that much the decision makers' opinion. Uh, when it comes to like, you know, Erdogan's vision for the Middle East, 
I think right now, you know, whatever vision that people had two or three years ago, everyone had to revise their vision, given what we had in hand. And I think, like you know, right now, one of the vision that one of the uh, you know one of the immediate vision I think that Erdogan has in mind regarding uh, Syria is to get rid of the Assad regime because uh, Turkey and Erdogan sees Assad regime as being the cause of many you know, of this uh, drama that we that are unfolding in the you know that are unfolding in Syria. So therefore like I can't talk about like you know the immediate visions but I cannot like now like you know talk about a region like region that Turkey has or Erdogan has in mind because like you know whatever he had pre Arab Spring like whatever calculation that people had pre Arab Spring has all all of them need to be like revised. And regarding the Iraq you know, again, I think like you know, Turkey will, is extremely un, uh, unhappy with uh, she, like you know, the sectarian politics that is being uh, that is being conducted in Baghdad. So therefore, like you know, we can talk about like you know, these immediate goals rather than a vision in the uh, vis-a-vis Erdogan's approach to the Middle East. Indeed, and, and we're just running out of time, but just um, uh, to to finish things up, um, Tunch, I mean, the reason I ask this is because I suppose um, there, there was an EU accession report uh, this week expressing on Turkish accession, expressing concern over um, Mr. Erdogan's banning of certain social media, biased airtime during the election. When I suppose the Western media report what they perceive to be relatively anti-Western comments, I'm just wondering maybe they think that there is a kind of a view or a, a vision for Mr. Erdogan to um, impose Turkish strength and dominance in the region. It's, it's less concerned about joining the European Union now, it's less concerned about what Brussels thinks, it's less concerned about Washington thinks. I am not sure how sincere Turkey is about the European Union membership because, I mean, European Union, let's face it, the membership has served its purposes in the sense that the, the Erdogan again effectively used the European Union to push the army to the background. And uh, now he's much more critical. Sometimes he resorts to this kind of discourse. But I don't think discourses are, you know, abstract things. They relate to the practices, foreign policy practices. We only understand, you know, these foreign policy practices by look at, looking at the discourses. And that Ottoman discourse or neo-Ottoman Ottomanist discourse is there. And it makes sense when we look at these actions, then we can only make sense of them by referring to this neo-Ottomanist, if you like, ambition, particularly this, uh, in a way, uh, stemming from Hamidian period. In a way, pan-Islamist ideology is much more influential from that Ottomanist discourse, you know, because there's pan-Turkist one, there is a kind of pan-Ottomanist, but there is a Hamidian. These are like neo-Hamidian, in a way, elites are trying to push this Islamic agenda. That's why they take sides with the Sunnis, because they're closer to their ideology than the other. And the Erdogan is constantly alienating people their own Kurds, the Alawites, and then the middle class, young, educated, highly, you know, the Gezi uprising and everything. I mean, I, I wouldn't really cash on Erdogan's democratic credentials in, in that sense. Um, just finally, Bill, I mean, it's it's not unusual for certain Middle Eastern countries and other countries in this coalition tackling ISIS to be perhaps not advertise their roles in the coalition as, as broadly as, as as perhaps America would like them to um, for, for their own domestic reasons. But um, uh, you think that um, eventually Turkey will come to the aid of the people in Kobani and eventually their fight against ISIS, although less important than overthrowing Assad, um, will still be very much a focus for Mr Erdogan. I'm not at all convinced they will come to the aid of the people in Kobani. In any case, it's getting rather late in the day. Um, we've been hearing that Kobani is going to fall for a number of days now and one's getting a little bit puzzled about exactly what's going on there. But Turkey's had plenty of time to come to the aid of the people in Kobani. And in fact, it's done anything but come to their aid. I mean, it's actually tried to obstruct people crossing the border. It's obstructed humanitarian assistance uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm, I'm really not sure that Turkey is hiding away or disguising that much about its role in the region. I think I, I agree very much with Tunch. I think to a degree what Erdogan says is what you get with Turkish policy, um, that he's laying out what the position is, and I think it's fairly clear. And certainly diplomacy diplomats, people like John Kerry, are not going to explode uh, all over the media. Um, but I have no doubt from my visit to Washington that there's a lot of frustration in the United States and that's having an impact 
uh, on the relationship and will continue to do so in the future. We'll see how it plays out. Many thanks. That's Bill Park, Senior Lecturer in Defence Studies at King's College London. He's also author of the book Modern Turkey, People, State and Foreign Policy in a Globalised World. Also joining me in the studio, Tunç Scheibach, Programme Leader of International Politics at Middlesex University and an advisor at the Centre for Turkey Studies. On the line we have Galip Dalay in Ankara. He's a political researcher at the think tank the Centre Foundation and currently a visiting fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. And on the line from St. Petersburg, Alexander Sotnachinka, Associate Professor at the St. Petersburg State University School of International Relations. Many thanks to you all for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia in London. if you like, uh, foreign policy practitioners in many respects. And then Turkey uh, seems to have chosen a kind of passive-aggressive kind of posture in, in relation to the Syrian crisis. Does that chime with what you think, Galip? There are mixed messages coming from uh, President Erdogan over just what kind of support it would lend the United States, if any. Well, I feel like Turkey first. I mean, uh, Turkey did not deny that it had let the U.S. to use its air force. Rather, it said, like, you know, more or less, it said, like, there is nothing new in our conversation with the United States. But that does, that did that did not exclude the possibility of the U.S. using the military bases in Turkey. And I think in the end, the military base in Turkey is going to be used. So therefore, like, it will be part of the support that Turkey is going to offer to the U.S. or the coalition. Uh, in their bombing campaign. And right now, the uh, primary concern for Turkey is that, like, you know, this uh, use of military. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. U.S.-led forces have stepped up airstrikes against Islamic State or ISIS fighters threatening the Syrian town of Kobani. That's near the Turkish border. This comes after Turkish officials denied reaching an agreement with the U.S. to use its Incirlik airbase in the southern city of Adana, 100 miles from the Syrian border. This runs counter to comments by the U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice, who said Turkey had agreed with Washington to let coalition forces use its military bases. The Turkish government has faced pressure to take up a more decisive role in fighting ISIS. Protests erupted around Turkey over a perceived lack of action from Ankara, which wants to see any help it offers tied to a coalition pledge to oust the Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad. So, is the campaign of ISIS shifting regional alliances? What will the US-led coalition's strategy to tackle ISIS be? And what have... With, the, with uh, Washington's Arab allies in the region, who very quickly committed to join the bombing campaign against ISIS. So Turkey's position is distinctive, but I'm not sure it's that ambiguous or, or even that new at the moment. So the, having Bashar al-Assad as part of the deal, um, his ouster being part of any kind of support, um, strange, I suppose, that the US and, and certainly Britain don't want to really make that too overt, um, that we're going to remove Assad parliament that, that faced a vote on this. It was, uh, it was, it was defeated last year. Um, not particularly popular. No, I mean, Britain and uh, the other NATO and Western allies, in fact, are not bombing in Syria at all. And the reason for that is because of the legal uh, uncertainty about doing so. Uh, in the case of Iraq, technically, the Baghdad government has invited allies to, to conduct a bombing campaign against the Islamic State. So legally, that stands up. Uh, Syria is a much more complicated case. I think also with Syria, uh, the West has been looking around for some moderate um, Turkey's role, well, to discuss this, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Tun Shaibak. He's programme leader of international politics at Middlesex University and an advisor at the Centre for Turkey Studies. Also here is Bill Park. He's a senior lecturer in defence studies at King's College London and his latest book is called Modern Turkey, People, State and Foreign Policy in a Globalised World. On the line we have Galip Dale in Ankara. Uh, he is a political researcher at the think tank, the Seta Foundation in Ankara. Currently he's a visiting fellow at the German Institute 
Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin, and also on the line from Russia, Alexander Sotnichenko. He's Associate Professor at the St. Petersburg State University uh, at the School of International Relations there. A warm welcome to you all, gentlemen. First of all, I'll start with you, Tunch. Uh, interesting what Turkey has said in that it's made no decision on offering help on the air base yet. Um, why do you think it's being so ambivalent? I think we are fishing in uh, muddy waters here because there's no clarity whether Turkey agrees to the use of military bases or not. Actually, this has been the typical policy of... of, of Sorry, the, the use, of, use of military base is basically depicted in the context of uh, bombing the ISIS, but not the rest of the, not the Assad regime. I think somehow Turkey wants to get, like, you know, some words, some declaration also that uh, somehow talks about some measures and action against the Assad regime. But in the end, uh, I think, like, you know, Turkey is going to uh, let the coalition to use its airbase. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about that, Bill? Is this just a play for time on uh, Mr. Erdogan's part? It's possible he'll eventually commit. I mean, I'm not sure there is that much ambiguity about the Turkish position. Um, essentially, what they're looking for is a commitment to the overthrow of Assad, first and foremost, um, with a number of steps between now and that, things like establishing a humanitarian corridor inside Syrian territory in a no-fly zone. So I think this is hard bargaining on the part of Turkey. They've been pushing this kind of agenda for some time now, and I think their position is quite clear. What is interesting about it is that it contrasts so much 